Hi everyone, welcome to the very first episode of On the Giant Shoulder. I'm John and without further delays, I'll introduce a very special guest who has been an inspiration to many and is widely known in the veterinary circle. It's absolutely a pleasure to have him joining us today. A very warm welcome to Dr. Charles Kuntz. Thank you, John. Um, I'd like to start by saying, talking a little bit about John. John uh, found us on YouTube and um, he came all the way over from Dubai, originally from Pakistan, and um, has just won the hearts of everybody here. Um, just so friendly and so willing to help and excited and enthusiastic. And it's actually a, a, quite a breath of fresh air for us to see somebody just uh, completely new, new to an environment and making absolutely the best of, um, uh, of your time here. And so we're really grateful for you coming and kind of re-energizing everybody with your enthusiasm. Thank you very much. You're, re you're really kind. Uh, okay, I'll begin with my first question. Uh, who was the biggest influence in you becoming a veterinarian? So I'd have to say, the, I've had a few different people that have influenced me, but my biggest influence would probably have to be my father. My father was a cardiac surgeon, um, and this was in early days in cardiac surgery, so it was in the early 70s when he started out in cardiac surgery. And so really cardiac surgery had only been around for about 15 years, and he was doing cardiopulmonary bypass, and and coronary artery uh, bypasses and all kinds of stuff when other people were having relatively high mortalities. He actually had a run of 200 patients without a single intraoperative mortality. And so that was my inspiration for the technical side of surgery. Um, he was also a huge animal lover. And um, I, we had to endure sitting in the, the zoo for two hours at a time just watching one particular cage full of monkeys and watching how they interacted and stuff. And he was uh, a very a very tough surgeon and he was a tough father, um, but he was a total softie when it came to animals. And there was one time that I remember when I was in university and I came home to visit him and he had two poodles. Um, and one day we went out to dinner and we came back and one of the poodles had gotten up on top of the dining room table and had pooped. And his response was not to yell at the dog, but to pick Tasha up and just pet her and apologize for having been out to dinner so long that she had to poop on the table. <laughs> so wow. um, that's the kind of person that he was as far as a, an animal lover. Right. Right. Uh, how was the vet school for you and what was your biggest challenge in the vet school? So vet school for me was fun. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I had lots of friends and um, I was very involved in the social aspect of vet school. I already had my job um, that was supposed to be my, you know, my career job from um, basically when I started vet school, which was to work for a general practice in my hometown. Mm -hmm. And so I never really had much inspiration or incentive to study very hard because there is a saying that CCC equals DVM, which means basically you make, you know, you kind of cruise through and uh, you get passing grades and you'll be a vet. And um, it wasn't until probably about a week before internship applications were due that one of my mentors and um, and supervisors, Dr. Gary Ellison, came up to me and said, have you ever thought about doing an internship? And I honestly had not thought about it. And so as soon as he said that, it made me think that maybe that was something that I wanted to do. And so I took 10 days, got my whole application in uh, to uh, the internship program and then wound up uh, getting matched at Animal Medical Center in New York City. And, um, and I basically didn't look back from there. Um, as far as challenges in vet school, I never really knew how to study. Uh, I had a pretty easy time in undergraduate because everything was conceptual physics, calculus, things like that. And um, I, was a, you know, I was a reasonably good writer and that kind of thing. And so English wasn't too hard for me. But when I got to vet school, uh, you had to just memorize huge volumes of information. And so I got a 47% on my first embryology exam. And that was a very, a uh, big shock to me that I was actually going to have to learn how to study. Um, so I found actually learning large volumes of road information quite challenging. Right. And uh, what was your favorite and least favorite subject in vet school? So my favorite subject probably, other than surgery, which I really enjoyed, I really liked neurology. And um, in my first year of veterinary school, we had a course in, basically it was neuroanatomy, it was a three-week course just before the winter break, and um, uh, a friend of mine and I took the first night of the course. It was Monday night, and we spent about until 2 a.m. learning the entire anatomy of the brain, all 160 structures on about 
probably 80 different sections of, um, of it, there were gross sections, it wasn't histopathology, and just learned everything so that the rest of the course was really just review for us. And, mm. and that was um, kind of like a, a, an awakening experience for me that if I did that um, going forward, that I would learn so much more from my classes because the lectures would be a review rather than new uh, exposure to the information. But that lasted about a week, and then I got back to school after winter break and went back, right back to the way I was doing right. things before. <laughs> Right. And the least favorite? Uh, probably embryology. <laughs> <laughs> I had such a hard time with it. And it was just, you know, I, because I got in to veterinary school after three years of undergraduate, I never took the core courses like anatomy and physiology and stuff right. like that. So everything that I was learning in vet school was completely new to me. And, um, and I really struggled with that. Also, things like parasitology, again, more memorization. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really enjoy that. Okay. Right. Okay, so uh, who was your favorite teacher or a mentor and what message would you like to give him if he would, you, he would be watching you today? Uh, so the main mentor that I had in undergraduate would have been Dr. Robert Goring, who's a, a specialist surgeon and, and orthopedic surgeon. And he um, was the first one really to take me under his wing when I was a, a pre-veterinary student, so in, in undergraduate university. And he was very, very compassionate and dedicated to his patients. And he was the first one that exposed me to the idea of becoming a specialist and becoming excellent at what you do. Um, and so um, to him, I would like to thank him for all of his inspiration and encouragement that I had uh, all the way through undergraduate. And um, I think that he's retired now, but I would actually really love to catch up with him and, and see how he's going. The other one that I had was Dr. Gary Ellison, and he was the one who uh, asked me if I had ever thought about doing an internship. And um, and he also, to this day, I still see him at conferences and stuff, and he's still so dedicated and innovative and really trying to improve what he does, even though he's probably, whatever, 60, you know, 65 or 68 years old, he's still uh, every day trying to improve his craft. Beautiful. All right. What advice would you give to a vet school student or a doctor new to the practice, especially those finding it hard with so much to learn and master? Um, it is a huge amount of information. And what I find really helpful is to try to approach each topic from multiple different directions, like read about it in a textbook and then maybe research it and find the original articles or papers that relate to um, your topic and then go on YouTube and watch a video. The other thing that I find really helpful is to try to tie things in from multiple disciplines like, you know, how would, um, uh, how would internal medicine relate to surgery and how would surgery relate to anatomy, that kind of thing, and try to, to look at it from all dis different disciplines at the same time. I have two sons in medical school and one thing that I've told them to do basically in their first semester, and I tell my residents to do the same thing, is to take a piece of paper, maybe a big piece of poster board, and put the clotting cascade down in the middle. So your intrinsic and extrinsic clotting pathways and then down to your common pathway. And then maybe put beside it the complement cascade and then bradykinin cascade and then inflammation and cyclooxygenase and wound healing and how does chemotherapy affect wound healing and all those things on one big piece of poster paper and then draw lines between where you have common pathways and common metabolites and things that are present on multiple pathways like platelet activating factor might be in the clotting cascade and it might be in platelet contents of platelet granules and platelet degranulation and bradykinin and, and all those kinds of things and when and how that affects wound healing and that kind of thing because when, when you tie all those things together and you get the really big picture um, it really emphasizes and solidifies that information. Wow that's a great piece of advice. Right. Uh, how did you come up with South Paws? Was it easy to pick up the name for your hospital? <laughs> well, that's a funny story. And, uh, and it wasn't a, a huge inspiration, although it is a great name because right. we're in the southern suburbs of, of Melbourne. Um, but when I was in America, I worked in a referral hospital and there was another guy that uh, worked in another practice and he was a specialist as well. And he was kind of a jerk. Wow. Um, and he treated us poorly and he would poach cases from us, try to poach staff and all kinds of stuff. And the name of his practice was Southpaws. And so when I moved to Australia, I was at an emergency hospital for about, for about five years. But when I opened my own hospital, I thought that is the ultimate re revenge on somebody um, 
who really annoyed me. <laughs> and, so, and so I named my practice Southpaws as well. Well, I and, never thought of that one coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have to, um, I have to say that despite the fact that he was not a nice person and he was a bit of a jerk, he did come up with a great name for a practice. So. Wow. Amazing. All right. Uh, how were the early days of uh, being at South Paws and what kind of challenges did you have? So I moved to Australia about 15 years ago and I was the only surgical oncologist in the eastern half of the United States. So that's a population of 150 million people or whatever, one surgical oncologist. And so I was busy and I had um, like seven cases booked three weeks in advance. And I just assumed that when I moved to Australia, that I'd be able to carry on that same level of practice. I knew it would maybe take a few months or whatever, but that I would be very, very busy when I moved here. Yeah. And when I got here, um, I was dead slow. Like I did not see a case for 11 days. I went and visited 65 practices in 10 days and put 160, uh, sorry, 1,600 kilometers on my parents-in-law's car. Um, in 11 days, just visit or 10 days, just visiting hospitals, not a single case came in. And then uh, I remember on the 11th day, my nurse, I had one nurse at the time, and she comes running in. She goes, Charles, Charles, there's a vet on the phone. Um, he wants to talk to you about a case. And so I picked up the phone and I was all excited thinking, ah, the drought has ended yeah. and uh, I'm, I'm going to be able to start my practice. And he said, uh, he said, is this Charles Kuntz? And I said, yeah. And he goes, is your wife Kate Savage? And I said, yeah. And he goes, when is she going to start practicing? I've got a horse for her to see. Wow. I was just gutted. <laughs> so <laughs> it did take a while for my right. practice to build up. And, you know, and weeks became months and months became years to the point that I had a very busy practice. Wow. What is a typical day for Dr. Charles as a veterinary surgeon? So I um, operate three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday is my administration day. And then I'm on call one weekend and four, which means I work a regular Saturday. So I'll do three or four surgeries on a Saturday. My typical day starts at eight o'clock in the morning when I arrive at work and we do rounds. Basically what rounds are is we are getting a handover from uh, the overnight intern um, to discuss what's happened with our patients overnight. And we are very inclusive in our rounds. So everybody in the hospital uh, at the time is included in rounds and we have the internal medicine team, emergency team, all the nurses, everybody is sitting in so that we can all discuss patients and uh, express any concerns that we might have or anything that might be going wrong. Yep. Um, and then um, after that, we talk about what cases are gonna come in on the day. Yep. And so I usually consult from 8.30 to 11 o'clock in the morning. And so we'll look at, you know, am I the only surgeon operating on the day or do we have three surgeons? Yep. Are we going to be competing for surgery suite time? And that kind of thing. And we try to get a, a plan um, going forward for what the day is going to entail. Are we going to have multiple arthroscopies that's going to, you know, where we're going to have to turn over equipment? Are we going to have multiple laparoscopies and that kind of thing? Um, and then we also recognize that if it's going to be a huge day, we might have to tell clients, look, we're happy to hospitalize your dog overnight. And if we can get to the surgery today, we will. But if we can't, we may have to put it off till tomorrow. And clients are really understanding about that if you warn them about it uh, ahead of time. Right. Nice. Um, and then at 11 o'clock, I start operating, and I usually operate on four or five patients a day. Uh, usually finish by about 5, 5.30. If I'm the only surgeon operating and I have a resident or two, then I can usually jump between surgery suites. Um, and like just as I'm finishing one case, the next case is knocked down, and it's very, very efficient wow. that way. But if we have three surgeons operating on the same day, then basically I get my surgery suite for the day, and so I have to wait for one patient to come out before the next patient goes in. Um, usually finished again by 5, 5.30. We have rounds in the afternoon to discuss what happened during the day and um, are there communications, uh, uh, have they been done appropriately with clients and that kind of thing, and maybe also discuss a little bit about what's happening the following day. Wow. Right. Uh, what advice uh, you would give to the vets that are thinking of owning a practice? So owning a practice is... Um, a relatively small percentage of actually doing clinical cases right. and the rest is management managing people trying to inspire your your team to get the best that you can out of them um, dealing with uh, you know there's a broken window the floor is leaking uh, we haven't paid our electricity bill that kind of thing and so a lot of it is is um, just day-to-day -day management of the function of, the, of a business yeah 
And, you know, before starting, I would take some time to consider what the structure of your business is going to be, um, whether it's going to be a sole proprietorship or whether you're going to have a corporation built around it, which is going to give you some liability protection. If you've got all your regulatory stuff down, your radiation license, your toxic substances license, you know, make sure that your license, your veterinary license is intact. Yeah. Then you have to organize your team, decide what kind of management you're going to do. Are you going to be... Um, a, a very team oriented where you're going to be at the same level at all as all of your staff yeah. or are you going to be um a, like a a, a a boss boss yeah looking down on uh, you know looking down on the rest of the staff and if you know if i could give any advice to a new practice owner is, is go for the team approach you might as well take it take advantage of the years of knowledge that all these team members have that they can provide to you and make your life easier wow that's a great advice. Um, what is your most favorite and least favorite surgery? So I love, um, I guess if you had to uh, um, simplify it or categorize it, I would say that I like technically challenging surgeries that don't take me too long. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I love spinal surgery. Uh, you know, a typical ducts and hemilaminectomy takes me about 45 minutes. It comes in and it's paralyzed. It's usually going to be walking in a few days. Um, it's very technical and precise, and so I really, really enjoy that. Adrenalectomy, thoracotomy, um, you know, lung lobectomy, laparoscopy, thoraco thoracoscopic surgery. Um, those are the things that I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, you know, they're again, they're technically challenging. I get bored after about an hour because I have a short attention span. I probably have um, ADHD. <laughs> so um, I like things that I can get through fairly quickly. Right. Yeah. And the least favorite? Uh, I'd have to say either a total ear canal ablation. Right. Um, which, uh, and, and the other one is an anal sacculectomy in a normal healthy dog. Yeah. And the reason is that with either one of those procedures, there's a lot at risk because you can give them facial nerve palsy, you can give them you know, vestibular, not in the anal surgery, but uh, yeah. <laughs> facial nerve palsy, yeah. vestibular signs, um, you know, bleeding. Uh, and so there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong and you don't have a great plan of dissection because of all the inflammatory tissue and that kind of thing. And that's kind of the same thing with an anal sac surgery, which is that you don't have a really great plan of dissection um, because you're cutting through this anal sphincter and you still have, you know, you have the risk of incontinence um, and other things. And so I find those quite frustrating. Okay. If not the vet, what else would you be doing? Um, so, uh, good question. Um, when I applied to vet school and I happened to get in after three years, if I hadn't gotten in after three years, I probably would have applied to medical school and veterinary school, and who knows right. what would have happened. I right. might have been a cancer surgeon in, in human uh, medicine or a cardiac surgeon or whatever. Uh, and so it was a bit, probably a bit fortuitous that I happened to get into vet school when I did, yep. um, and, then, and then I didn't have to apply again. The other thing that I really enjoy doing, I like technology, and from my YouTube channel and stuff like that, I... I I just, I like how I can use technology to enhance my practice and, and to en enhance my enjoyment. And uh, about seven years ago, almost exactly seven years ago to the day, I was doing woodworking, stuck a chisel through my hand oh. and cut three tendons and two nerves and two arteries. Wow. And um, I was actually looking into the hole in my hand thinking, do I really need to go to the hospital? And then I made a fist and my index finger didn't come down. <laughs> and oh. so I thought, okay, this might be a little bit more serious. And then I actually went through the thought in my head, how much do I really need my index finger? And then, um, and then I drove my car. It was a manual transmission. Oh. And so I'm driving with a towel wrapped around my hand and I drove home to pick up my 14-year-old son so that we could drive to the hospital so that he oh could God. shift for me. <laughs> and so then I got to the hospital and I'm sitting in the hospital bed thinking... Um, you know, making a fist repeatedly, realizing that my finger wasn't moving, wondering if I would be able to keep doing surgery. And so I thought what I would probably do is um, is become a consultant and talk to physicians and dentists and veterinarians about technology that they could use to enhance their practice, you know, with video yeah. and iPads and software and, and social media and that kind of thing. So that's probably what I would end up doing um, if I weren't doing surgery today. Right. Okay, moving on to the next question, which we find it very difficult one. And uh, that is that, how do you look at the term euthanasia? 
which is more difficult, performing the procedure or breaking the news to the owner? So euthanasia, I'm, I'm a big believer in euthanasia, and I think euthanasia is one of the biggest gifts we can give to our beloved pets. Yeah. Um, it's an opportunity to end suffering, and um, I, I really see it as a positive thing um, that, uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a sign that we've given up or that we've given up on the patient or that yeah. we've lost the battle. It's just, it's just an opportunity to prevent suffering. Um, when I was an intern, I, on my first day of my internship, I euthanized three patients. Oh. And, uh, and I recognized very quickly that I could turn that into what would be otherwise a horrible experience for, for the client yep. um, into a very positive one. And by getting to know the client and spending time with the pet and, um, and making sure that they were prepared for what was going to happen yep. to turn a negative experience into a very positive one where they'd look back on it, not with just horrible memories, but with a positive memory and knowing that they were giving a gift to their pet um, in, in doing the best thing. And yep. again, I believe in the same thing for people. I think that um, that people that are suffering should have the right to choose yeah. um, when you know when it's time to come to the end of their life. And it's an interesting dichotomy where where humans have the ability to choose, whereas animals don't have that don't ability. Have. And so we have to make that choice for them sometimes. Yeah. Um, obviously, I think it's a, a you know I, I I think I'm disgusted by people that come in and want to put a healthy pet to sleep just because yeah. it's inconvenient for them. Um, uh, to continue living with it, yeah. but um, but in cases of suffering, I think it's a really great gift. Um, yeah, and then and then the actual act of putting a, a pet to sleep is quite peaceful. We you know we put in an intravenous catheter and we give them an overdose of an anesthetic first yeah. before we actually give the the solution that's going to stop their heart, and um, and so they don't they don't suffer. They don't know that they're they think they're just going to sleep. sleep yeah. the, the hardest part is is the interaction with the owner and yeah. people that are coming to our practice as especially a hospital and and the same thing in yeah. in general practice is you know, it's, it's the b beloved family member. And so yeah. it's a really, really hard thing to do. True. And that's true. Right. Uh, moving to a lighter question. I'm sure. I hope it is. What is your style of management? Are you a boss or a leader? So that's a, a great question. And I just went to a conference last week. Yeah. And I really hadn't defined in my own mind whether I was a boss or a leader. I thought I was kind of both and whatever. <laughs> um, but we had a discussion about three different terms. Um, a manager, which I, I think is what you're implying is a boss, yeah. a leader, and leadership. Yeah. And leadership applies to both a manager and a leader. Leadership is inspiring your team to get the best that you can out of them and also for them to get the most enjoyment and satisfaction out of what they do. And so whatever techniques you use to inspire your team um, to perform at their best and also yeah. to get the greatest satisfaction, that's leadership. Mm Vis or, uh, uh, being a leader is being a visionary. And I think being a leader is looking at uh, facets or, or issues that are external to your business, whether it's a veterinary hospital or whether you're Steve Jobs with Apple. It's thinking yeah. about what external um, factors or influences are going to affect your business. What's the economic market? What is the um, you know uh, regulatory market? Are they going to... Um, make like for example in in Australia uh, there was an issue with Hendra virus with horses right. which was a fatal disease to both humans and potentially horses and so when Hendra virus became an issue equine practices had to change the way that they practice and so that would be a leader that would take their their practice and their clients through that kind of change yep. um, you're looking at, in, at innovations in equipment uh, what's latest in the literature you're looking at a, a vision for your hospital. Do you want to expand? Do you want to start doing a different service because you think that it's the best thing to do yeah. business-wise and for your clients? That's in contrast to a manager or a boss who looks very is is inward focused, yeah. and they're going to look at things like um, human resources, hiring, firing, wages, um, accounting, bookkeeping, you know, day-to-day -day marketing, yeah. hiring or um, sorry, ordering stock. Yeah, yeah. When, when things are going to run out, things like that. And so, um, and I hate that part of the practice. Um, I do it. And luckily I came along um, 
James Simcock, who I hired basically out of veterinary school, and he's come up through the ranks, internship, surgical internship, residency, specialist, and now he's my business partner, oh. and he's really taken over the management side of things so that I can concentrate on what I love, yep. which is the, um, uh, the visionary stuff and the, the leadership stuff, uh, you know, my YouTube channel, that kind of thing. And um, there's a saying, um, you know, find your genius. Yep. And, and, and go with it and maximize it rather than thinking I'm really bad at management and so I'm going to have to learn how to be a better manager. Yeah. It's finding somebody else to do the management yeah. and I do the visionary stuff and the leadership stuff. And, and James might have come along and said, I'm a great manager, but I'm not very good at strategy and, and, and vision. And so I'll come up and I'll find somebody else and do, to do that part of the business. Um, and so they, they say that as a leader, as a business leader, you should always be the dumbest person in the room. And you need to find people that are smarter than you. Because if you're the smartest person in the room, you've hired the wrong people. Yeah. You want to hire people that can bring things bring to things. you and, 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 um, and help you advance your practice. So. Right. Okay, moving on to the next question. As a team leader, what expectations do you have from your team? And what advice would you give them? So... Um, Expectations, that's, some, that's a place that we have kind of faltered recently. Right. We've grown from being, uh, I had one nurse 15 years ago to six staff 10 years ago, and now we're up to about 50 staff. Yeah. And when we were very small, it was easy because I had really, really dedicated people that, that were all part of the original South Paws vision. Yeah. And in fact, I probably took advantage of them at the time because they, you know, if we had a, a case come in at, six o'clock at night, they'd all say, oh, let's stay and do it and let's all stay together. And there, you know, the family life suffered and family members and partners became resentful of the hospital, yeah. that kind of thing. And I think it's important for people to get out of the place and finish at a time that they know, you know, if, if you know that three days a week you're going to finish at six o'clock, it's easier to stay until nine o'clock on that fourth day because you know on the other three days you're going to be home. Yeah. And so I don't expect people to devote their entire lives to... The hospital. I expect them to come in, um, give 100% while they're here, and then at the end of the day, at the end of the shift, to go home and enjoy their families. Um, and uh, and I expect people to behave professionally. Yeah. You don't have to be best friends with everybody you work with, but you have to behave professionally. And I like it when people get along and are friends, and I like it when people go out and socialize outside of work yeah. and go to the movies and go out to dinner and things like that. But it's not a requirement. You don't have to love everybody you work with but you have to treat people with respect um and then i also like humor i like uh, you know that's a that's a probably one of my number one core values is right. because a, a silly joke or an inappropriate joke or whatever really lightens up the day makes yeah. people get along better it has to be done at an appropriate time yeah and uh and in an appropriate location we're lucky because the two halves of the hospital here are separate literally by 10 meters or whatever where the clients are up at one half of the hospital and the staff are all in the other part of the hospital and so we don't have to worry about noise leaking up to the front right. and, you know right. and clients hearing people laughing yeah. and stuff but that was a problem when we were all in one place right. um, and so when you do have you don't have the luxury of the geographic separation of the two you really have to be careful um, with how you know how uh, raucous the laughter is and stuff um, yeah yeah so um what was the question? Advice. <laughs> <laughs> Advice. Uh, so you yeah. added a humor in that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so advice to my team yeah. would be to try to clarify in your own mind what you want out of this job and what yeah. you want out of this place and where you want to go with your career. And then make sure you tell us so that if it's that you want to learn how to do a new procedure or do ultrasound or something like that, we can arrange that and, and send you to a course so that you can come back and feel fulfilled. Yeah. And if your dream is to work at Fitzpatrick Referrals in the UK um, and that that's been your lifelong dream, then how can we help you to achieve that? Yeah. And we, you know, we recognize that not everybody's going to spend their entire career with us, but we want them to get the most out of uh, what they can from us so that they can move on and um, and have a fulfilling career. And we find that if we do that, that fewer people are likely to want to move on and go somewhere else and more people are going to want to stay with us. So. Wow, that's beautiful. All right, uh, next question is, what path or guideline can young surgeons follow to master their skills? 
So that's a tough question um, about what, you know, you're, you're in general practice and you're thinking, you know, you, you feel like maybe you're stagnating a little bit, right. you're not advancing in your field. How can you master um, uh, an aspect of surgery? And um, I have a couple of different pieces of advice. Number one is to learn one procedure at a time. You don't have to be a master of everything. Be a master of one thing first yep. and, and take that procedure and read about it, pull the articles um, uh, on that procedure watch some YouTube videos, and then make a checklist of what you want to accomplish in that surgery. And then when you actually get into surgery, don't try to rush. Try to, try to be perfect. Um, there's, there's no reason for speed early on. You want to, yeah. you want to be perfect. Yep. Um, and then with perfection and perfecting your skills, the, the speed will come. Yep. Um, but that shouldn't be a primary focus. Um, number two is, um, is take a lot of photographs and, and do video. Uh, I'm always a big proponent of doing video because, number one, um, you know that if you're being videoed or being photographed, you're going to do a better job and yeah. your yeah. suture is going to be neater yeah. and, and you're going to take more time to, um, to perfect it. You know, some people ask me, how can you do YouTube videos with everybody watching and, um, and you know, don't you feel a lot of pressure? And I don't. I'm, I'm going to do um, my, the best job that I can um, for the patient, but I also, when I know that that there might be 10,000 people that are going to watch this later on. I'm going to make sure I'm going to do a good job. Yeah. Number one, and number two, I'm not going to make up any BS. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm talking I'm going to make right. sure that I know what I'm talking about yeah. because um, I know that people are going to view it later on. Um, and then um, the other thing is that when you take photographs during surgery, you can really reflect on what you were feeling and what you were thinking when you look back. And I have photos that were taken from 18 years ago. I've got about 65,000 photos on my wow. computer. I can go back and think, okay, I remember that case and I remember how I was feeling and the things that I was thinking about. And so to reflect on it, um, you can relearn from that surgery all over again, even though you're not at the table, you can go back and refeel and relearn those things that you were thinking when you were going through it. Um, Another uh, aspect is cadaver surgery, and some people have the, the luxury or the yeah. benefit of using cadavers. Um, the first thing is that you have to treat that animal with respect because you are learning so much from that, that gift that that animal has given you. Um, and so treat it with respect and treat it as if it's a real patient. Um, and then and, and use good soft tissue technique and, and learn as much as you can um, from that um, you know, from that patient and from the anatomy, make a list of procedures that you'd like to get through with that patient. Um, and, and before you start doing it, make sure that you read up on it and study it and learn it as if you were going to be operating on a real patient. Um, you don't want to just hack through the patient and, yeah. and, um, and it's basically, that's a waste of time. You might as well use it as a, like a live fire, um, uh, situation where you can get the most that you can out of it. Um, and then the, the, the last thing is to own your mistakes. When you make a mistake, make sure that you don't blame it on the patient, don't blame it on the owner. You know, understand that you, that, that you made an error and how can you learn from that going forward. I had a, a mentor when I was a resident who used to say, no matter how good you feel about how you did in a surgery, make sure you think about three things you could have done better. Um, to really be humble and, and introspective and think, you know, okay, I know it's going to be fine, but... I could have put this screw in better, or I could have put in a longer screw, or I could have put in a different plate, um, or whatever. And really, you know, and, and when things go wrong, really, you know, really be introspective and think about what you contributed to that failure. Right. Wow, that's amazing. Like it's a bunch of advices, I would say, and uh, I'm sure many of the young surgeons that are watching this, they will benefit from it. Thank amazing. You. Moving on to the next question is, how do you keep up with changing trends and new advancements in veterinary surgery? Uh, so tricky. Um, you're asking me all the hard questions. <laughs> um, in surgery, as a specialist, I have the luxury of only having to focus on one field. Right. And, you know, if I can keep up with seven journals, um, you know, and the articles that apply to small animal surgery and seven journals, that's pretty much all the knowledge that I have to keep up with. And I'm actually really, um, I have a great deal of respect um, for general practitioners who have to keep up with vaccination protocols and surgery and regulatory issues and internal medicine and endocrinology and flea control and, you know, parasitology and all kinds of stuff. And it would be really difficult to keep up with all yeah. of those things. And the, the advice that I would give you is um, 
don't try to be too broad. Yeah. Uh, you know, try to focus your, your area of interest a little bit if you can. And again, focus on your genius, which yeah. is your, the areas that you excel in. And you don't have to be an expert in internal medicine and in surgery and whatever. If you can divide and conquer within your practice and, and identify somebody, oh, I love internal medicine. Yeah. So let them go and do the ultrasound co- course and the continuing education in yeah. internal medicine. Yeah. And you love surgery, and so you focus on surgery so that you can, at least within your own hospital, be kind of a specialist in your field. Right. Um, and um, and keeping up with the trends and advancements. Yeah, so, so attend conferences, right. workshops, um, Veterinary Information Network or VIN is really good because right. you can have access to a lot of different specialists that you can post a question and they'll they'll you know you'll have three or four different specialists that will respond to you. Right. Um, there's also you can go back and review the different chat rooms in anesthesia and orthopedic surgery, soft tissue surgery for the last 25 years or whatever, and look at other people. That if you're shy, you yep. don't want to post a case yourself. You can go back and look at what other people have posted. Um, textbooks always helpful to remember that textbooks are about five years out of date when you buy them um, off the shelf. Oh. So I was an editor, a section editor for Slatter's Textbook of Surgery and Oncology, and I remember from the first article or the first chapter that I received from a contributing author to the day the book was on the shelf for the first time was five years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so a lot can happen in five years. So, And then if you have specialists available to you, make use of them. Um, you know, our whole business model is based on providing advice to general practitioners. And so most specialists are going to be willing or more than happy to give you advice, even if it doesn't result in a referral, yeah. because we recognize that you're in the trenches, you know, you're doing the hard work yeah. and you need support and, and, and can feel isolated. And so yeah. we're going to help you out whenever we can. And if your specialist doesn't do that for you, try to find a new specialist. Yeah, right. <laughs> Amazing. All right, moving on to the last question. Um, how do you look at the future of small animal clinics or specialty hospitals in terms of business and competition? Great question. Um, and that's a big issue. I think that being in GP practice, um, yeah. you're really um, being squeezed from two directions. Yeah. Number one, um, you the specialists are telling you, oh, you have to refer everything. Yeah. So you're losing those top end cases. At the bottom end, you have the online pharmacies that are cut, you know, uh, uh, reduce pricing you out of the market when it comes to drugs. Yeah. Um, and so clients are coming to you and say, can you write a prescription for the online pharmacy instead of buying it from you? And so you're really being squeezed from both directions. Yeah. And then coming in from the side is corporate um, practices. And you have um, uh, corporations that own hundreds of practices and have the benefit of uh, volume shopping for consumables mm. and um, and sometimes they have their own laboratories and all kinds of things and so they can make the prices cheaper so that yeah. their profit margin can be higher yeah but if you're not in a corporate group I think that that can still be an advantage because especially the branded corporate groups um, they can get a reputation of being you know maybe over servicing or yeah. or being uncaring or unfeeling and so um, if you're in an area, you know, there's some in the United States that have their reputation that if you come in with cystitis, you you know, that vet is going to have to do x-rays, ultrasound, blood work, urinalysis, culture, this and this. And, um, and so if you are your own boss, you can have the benefit of tailoring a treatment course that's appropriate for, um, you know, for your patient. For your patient, yeah. You know, when you're being squeezed in all those different directions, that can cause a lot of stress and anxiety. Yeah. You know, worrying about, you know, not generating enough revenue, not getting the cool cases, um, you know, losing the, the, you know, the pet foods, you know, people are going to pet stores to buy yeah. pet food instead of coming to you. You can re- feel really, really squeezed. And so I would just really encourage you to focus on value. And there's something called the Pareto Principle, which is, where 80% of your business is going to come from the top 20% of your clients. Mm -hmm. And so the bottom 80% of your clients are not providing a huge amount of business and they're giving you 80% of your headaches. And so concentrate on your top clients and really provide value to them by providing the best service that you can. Don't always offer the cheapest service first because you think the client isn't interested in paying for it or can't afford it or whatever. Offer what's best for the pet first, and you have to be an advocate for the pet because the pet can't speak for itself. Yeah. You have to make a case to the client that this is the best treatment option that we can give you, and if you 
decide, no, I can't afford that, or no, I don't want to pay for that, then you can say, okay, we don't have to do blood work. But remember that we've put this on here for a reason. It's not just because we want to make money. It's because yeah. it's the right thing to do for your pet. And so, you know, if, if you have a vet who says, we can give you options one, two, three, and four, and the client thinks that they're equivalent, they're going to pick the cheapest. It's na human nature. If I go to, uh, to buy a car and they say, yeah. we can buy, you can buy this car for $50,000 or I can give you exactly the same car for $30,000, what idiot would pick the $50,000 car? Absolutely. Yeah. You have to, to make the point that there's value in, in the number one option, which is yeah. the best option for the health of your pet. Um, and so um, make sure that, that you explain the value. You know, if somebody calls you and says, how much do you charge for a dog spay? Don't just say $285. Talk to them and say, well, we, you know, we provide blood work in every case. Every case is going to be put on fluids. You're going to have a vet who's done a thousand of these. You're going to have a vet nurse who's, scrubbed, who's either scrubbed into surgery or doing the anesthetic. And once they hear all of that, mm. the, the price is almost an afterthought. They're like, oh, I don't care yeah. how much it costs. I'm coming to you. Right. Um, and so that's the kind of mindset. And, and if you lose... 50% of your clients because they go to the cheaper option, that's great because their values don't align with yours. Yeah. You want to pick those top clients that align with your values and that are going to appreciate the fact that you're going to do the best thing that you can for the pet. Right. Beautiful. Right. Uh, Dr. Charles, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for accepting my request for an interview and uh, thank you for providing us an opportunity to see the veterinary world from your shoulder and parting your wisdom. Thank now, you that's such much. a pleasure and it's such a Again, it's it's such an inspiration to see you here and excited and and interested and in trying to get everything that you can out of every surgery. And um, uh, I think I've probably learned more from you than you've learned no. from me. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's really kind of you. No worries at all. Well, I look forward to seeing you again. Hopefully sure. you'll be back in Australia sure. with your wife and child in the yep. next couple of years. Um, and we can just continue the, the fantastic friendship we've created. Sure, definitely. Thank you very much, Doc. No worries. Thank you. Thank you.